Welcome to the uh, second installment of the Sci of Living History series, an interview with Paul W. Thayer. A uh, little background, the Sci of Living History series is a continuous series of interviews conducted by the Sci of History Committee each year at the Sci of Conference. These interviews are with notable lifelong contributors to the field of industrial organizational psychology and to the Society of Industrial Organizational Psychology. Originally, the uh, interviewee this year was to be University of South California professor and compensation expert Edward Lawler. Uh, Dr. Lawler, his family had some medical concerns, so he was unable to attend the conference this year. Uh, we in the history committee were thrilled, very, very grateful that uh, someone as worthy and deserving as Dr. Thayer was willing to step in. Uh, so now I would like to introduce. Too far. Uh, Dr. Uh, Paul W. Thayer. Uh, Uh, Dr. Thayer's career has been split between industry and academics as a researcher, teacher, trainer, and consultant. With a doctorate from Ohio State University, Dr. Thayer was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania for two years before working at the Life Insurance Marketing and Research Association, LIMRA, for over 20 years. Uh, Dr. Thayer then left to become a professor at North Carolina State University. Uh, Paul Thayer is a co-author with Bill McGahey of one of the classic work books in Iowa psychology, Training in Business and Industry, published in 1961, along with dozens of other scholarly publications, often focusing on the training specialty of Iowa psychology. Dr. Thayer is a retired SIOP fellow and was president of SIOP from 1976 to 1977. Uh, welcome, Dr. Thayer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have to pause momentarily to acknowledge the fact that this is May 17th, the 200th anniversary of the independence of Norway. My wife is Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> From Sweden. Uh, talk a little bit uh, about your uh, childhood, uh, Dr. Thayer. You want to go back that far? Um, <laughs> I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. Lived there all about. Sorry, lived there all about three months. Can you get me now? Yeah. Okay. Lived there all about three months. Uh, uh, Lindy was barnstorming after his flight to Paris, and my mother tells me that she took me out to the airport and held me up so I could see Lindy. I don't remember it, but that's what she tells me. From there we went to Richmond, to uh, Buffalo, New York, where I went to elementary school, to Swarthmore High School, where I graduated. After I went to Penn State, for a little bit, and came back to graduate from high school. Then uh, Penn State for two years, then to Kings Point, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And then came back, went back to Penn State to finish up. Went on to Ohio State, and that's it. <laughs> Would you like to share some of your experiences when you were in the military? Well, King, King, the United States Marine Academy is unusual in that you, when you graduate, you get a commission both in the Naval Reserve and in the Maritime Service. As a matter of fact, you can get one in the Navy or the Army or the Air Force. Uh, one of the graduates is the husband of the Arizona congressman, congresswoman who was shot. Uh, he's a graduate of King's Point. And it, it, about a third of every class uh, joins the military. Um, I was able to, I was in basic training when BJ Day occurred. I was in San Francisco on GBJ, BJ Day, and boy, if you want to see it wild, it was wild. <laughs> From there, I caught a ship to Japan, Manila, Singapore, Calcutta, through Suez, passed to Gibraltar, and came back to the East Coast and finished my circumnavigation. Uh, after another ship, another ship which took me to Marseille and back, uh, I thought I was done with an 18-month 18 18 program to get my commission. But it was peacetime now, and I now had two years to go. 
So it ended up being a three and a half year program instead of an 18 month program. Uh, I said, what the heck, I'll ship out for a while. And I did, you know, <coughs> as, a, as an engineer, Unfortunately, I did choose engineering, thinking that if I was going to be an industrial psychologist, it might be useful to speak the language of engineers. It turned out that that wasn't so important, except that it did get me an assistantship at Ohio State, because Paul Fitz thought that I'd be a perfect graduate student for his engineering psychology program. Uh, I took one course with Paul and decided that I was not going to be an engineering psychologist. <laughs> What were some of your memorable experiences when you were a graduate student at Ohio State? Well, there's one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I met Bjork at Ohio State, and uh, we were married there in, six, in 51. And uh, it'll be 63 years coming this June. Uh, <laughs> But we think it might last. <laughs> uh, we had our first, after, after a couple of years, we had our first child. And we became known as that nutty couple because I taught from intro psych from 8 to 10 and she had the sections that went from 10 to 12. And so she would hand me the baby and I would be bouncing Scott on my arm, waiting for him while talking to my students. And then I'd take Scott home for lunch and so forth, and then she'd come back and join me. Uh, at that time, that was very unusual back then, to have a married couple going to school with kids. Not very unusual anymore, but it was then. So see, I was, we were brown <laughs> Um I had the best research design course from a comparative psychologist uh, who was a, a very, difficult taskmaster, but a wonderful teacher. He taught me more about research design than, design than the two courses that were that taught research design. Uh, this was Don Meyer, an amazing person. I was Bert's assistant, Harold E. Bert, fortunate, a wonderful gentleman. Uh, always stood behind you if you needed help. Uh, really, really swell, swell person. Uh, later on, his first graduate student, who was president of CBS, endowed a chair in industrial psychology at Ohio State. And Jim Naylor proceeded later on to take it away from industrial psych. Matter of fact, he destroyed the program <laughs> and uh, turned it over. I think somebody in psycholinguistics or something like that now has that chair. Um, Anyway, it was a good experience. I learned how to be a rat runner. We took care of the rat labs over Christmas and summer vacations. Do anything to eat, you know. <laughs> it's a lot. So after you uh, finished up uh, at uh, Ohio State, uh, you moved on and you taught for two years uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. In your autobiography, you complained of a very heavy teaching load. Um, talk about uh, your interactions there, um, and particularly with uh, the prototypical I.O. psychologist, Morris Vitellis. Uh, well, you, you promoted me. I was an instructor, not a professor. Um, <laughs> I felt very lucky to get a teaching job. I had gone into, I had planned to have a career in industry, but I was brainwashed by the faculty and knew that I wanted to be a teacher. And I went to Penn, very one of the very few of us that had been able to get a teaching job. And the, the course load was fantastic and partly because I had to supplement my $3,200 a year salary uh, with a night class to bring it all the way up to $3,600 uh, for a year. Uh, Patelis was a, a, a very interesting guy. He, he was demanding, uh, especially of his graduate students. Uh, he, but but he, he also was so busy with his consulting that he wasn't around very much. 
And I went to him one time and I said, you know, Dr. Tellis, you know, I've been here a year. Uh, one of the reasons I came to Penn was to be able to interact with you. And he looked at me and he said, well, we've got to change that. And so he very carefully set aside a couple of hours, one afternoon a week, where we were supposed to meet and discuss the current literature and that kind of thing. And it started out being a very wonderful experience, but unfortunately his, his workload overcame that and that kind of, it died after about two months. Um, one of the most interesting experiences I had at Penn was uh, doing research on the armadillo. I happened to discover, when looking up another word in the dictionary that was on the same page as a picture of an armadillo, that they have identical quadruplets about 90% of the time. And so I wanted to see whether or not they would learn a simple visual discrimination as rapidly as a rat would. So that then you could have four perfectly matched groups. Uh, it worked out. I was able to borrow a, an armadillo from the zoo. I had taught him or her never could sex an armadillo. <laughs> Simple discrimination, about as rapidly as a, as a rat would do it. Uh, they're, they smell, they're, they're awful to work with because they smell and they, they buck and if you're not wearing gloves, uh, they would really tear your hands to pieces. Uh, my graduate student and I submitted an article to science, but they rejected it. Uh, primarily because we, the literature we cited was the work that had been done to demonstrate that they did have identical quadruplets. And they rejected it because that was done in about 1903, and we didn't have anything later in the literature, in our literature citation. And by the way, there wasn't anything else in the literature between 1903 and when we were there. But um, unfortunately, it, it, it became increasingly clear that Penn and I weren't getting along. Uh, I really wanted to, I really wanted a job where I could do training research, where I would have a ready research bed, where I would have support without writing grants all the time. And when I talked to my former roommate at Ohio State, Rod Baer, who was at that time in charge of the placement office at APA, he said, you're out of your mind, you'll never find that. But in February of 56, he called me, he said, you got to go to EPA because your job is being listed there. And I went and met Joe Weitz, wonderful person, from, at that time, Liama, later Lamra, and he, we got along and I went to Hartford for an interview with Range Wallace and came back and walked in the door. I didn't say a word, but my wife looked at me, she said, when are we moving to Hartford? because I really was excited, very excited. Can you talk a little bit about uh, mentors um, and your experience, like uh, Lester Guest and Bill McGahee and Reince Wallace and Joe Lights? For some of you who are still in school, grab yourself a mentor. It's the best, best the most wonderful thing, part of your education you're gonna get. At Penn State, I had the for good fortune to work with Lester Guest, who was a consumer psychologist and had his own little private consulting firm. And he, by the time I graduated from Penn State with my bachelor's degree, I knew how to develop a sampling frame, how to actually draw the sample, develop an interview protocol, train the interviewers, select the interviewers, analyze the data, and write the report. All this before I had my bachelor's degree. It was a wonderful experience and I planned to do my doctoral studies. Unfortunately, I, but Lester said, no, don't, don't, don't stay here at Penn State. For one thing, you sat on all my graduate courses, which he invited me to do. And for the other, he, he said, you need a new bias. Go someplace else. And he was right, I needed a new bias. Uh, at uh, at Limra, I had the good fortune to have his immediate superior, Joe Weitz. I don't know if you know Joe Weitz or not, but Joe did, Joe and Bob Knuckles did the original research on uh, realistic job expectations. Um, brilliant green thumb researcher. I would walk in with a cumbersome research design that had all kinds of 
stuff hanging all over it. And Jim, Joe would say, Paul, what are you trying to do? What is your real objective? And then he would say, we'll get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. And finally, he would have a neat, clean design. He taught me an awful lot about doing decent, clean research. Range Wallace is just uh, an extraordinary man, the former president of uh, SIOP, at that time Division 14. Um, he, uh, he was a marvelous communicator. He could talk to insurance executives in plain ordinary language and make, make research exciting for them. Uh, he also knew how to take a young PhD who thought he was as smart as hell <laughs> and expose him to some very smart marketing vice presidents and have him discover that there are some people out there that were smarter than he was. And that was a very useful experience for him, very useful. <clears throat> um, let's see. You had to come to, to work with uh, Bill McGee. Oh, Bill McGee, that was, when I was at Ohio State, uh, Bill wrote Bert and said, I need somebody to come down and set up a consumer panel. And he was working at Fieldcrest Mills in uh, just in Lakesfield Spray and Draper, north of Greensboro, North Carolina. And Bert knew that I had all the six friends with lesser guests, so he said, I've got a person for you. So I went down there with Bill, and Bill just, you talk about a good psychologist. Uh, how many of you have read on the effectiveness of not holding a formal training course? Uh, we got two, <laughs> three. Um, Bill had the job at one time of, uh, the president of the company came to me and said, you know, the managers tell me that these union stewards are running these foremen ragged. Uh, they know the contract backward and forward and our foremen don't. So I want you to hold a training course on the union contract. Now Bill knew that the foreman weren't going to sit still for that for very long, but he didn't argue. He just said, "Good idea, but we, to save time and money, we better find out what they know already, so we don't teach them stuff that they already know." He then turned to me. I was waiting for data to come in from my consumer panel, and he needed to keep me busy. So he said, I want you to write the toughest examination you can on the union contract. Split hairs if you like. Make it mean, make it tough, make it difficult. Then he got, then he turned to the different managers. There's a towel mill and a blanket mill and a rug mill and a sheeting mill and so forth. And he got them to start betting on what their foreman would get on the examination. And so all of a sudden, it was going to be open book because you could always carry your contract with you. All of a sudden, they, all the exams went out on the same time. They hit each plant the same minute. And you have never seen such activity in your life. Foremen were meeting before work, over at the coffee break, at lunchtime, after work, be arguing with each other about what the answers were and so forth. And at the end of two weeks, all the exams came in. And instead of the first prize to, for the one who had the best answers, being a dinner for himself and his wife, with the company president and his wife, we had a dinner for every single foreman. Uh, now, was it an effective program? Bill made it sure, made sure that everybody knew who wrote that exam. And at that little pre-dinner beer, beer time, um, uh, but North Carolina was very dry at that time, so they could give us beer or wine. And uh, I was jammed up in the corner with foremen all around me, arguing, to pointing out to me that there were at least two correct answers to this question or to that question or to some other question. And literally, I knew that contract pretty well, but there's some of those guys were quoting passages of, the, uh, of that contract. I mean, literally, two or three, four paragraphs, verbatim. And I would say, yeah. So Bill was a, at that point, somebody said, I, I, I was still interested in training, but there wasn't a decent training book around. I mean, there was some stuff on education, but nothing really good on training. Nothing that included what we knew about learning. 
And so I said, Bill, you know, you got to write a book. And Bill said, okay, if you'll write it with me. And so I then discovered how hard it is to write a book. I wrote that between 10 at night and 2 in the morning because I was still, I was working at Limerick later on. This was years later. And uh, I discovered how to, how to get out of writer's block. You want the clue? Get yourself a, an imperial quart of beer, <laughs> put it on the table, drink as you're writing out longhand, which is the way we did it back then. Uh, and you have a rule that says you must cover a complete page before you can get out of your chair for any reason, for any reason. Somehow a pressure begins to build up and you decide that you really want to make sure that you get something written down. So you start writing and believe it or not, it starts out being trash. But there were times that I would write three or four pages because the thing began going and so forth. So if you want to get the writer's block, get your imperial quart of beer and make sure that you don't get out of the chair until you've got at least one page covered. So you uh, worked at uh, Limra from uh, 1956 to uh, 1977. What is Limra? Um, and okay, describe Limra, what you, how you came to work there. Limra is a nonprofit trade association which does not do public relations and does not do lobbying. It is the it, it is is kind of the marketing research arm. It does. It does benchmarking, collects all kinds of data for benchmarking. It, it did selection research, training research, public opinion research, uh, actuarial kinds of things. And uh, it had, at that time, about 285 member companies, uh, primarily in the US and Canada, but also some associate members all over the world, Japan, Australia, <coughs> South Africa, Mexico, South America, etc. Uh, you can't think of a life insurance company that does, that does not belong to the limo. Uh, I went out there as a training researcher, then became director of human resources research after Joe Weitz went to NYU, and then when Range Wallace left and went to AIR and later to Ohio State, uh, I became Vice President of Research, which I was for quite a while. And then when the senior VP died unexpectedly at the age of 45, the President asked me to step into that job, which I found the dumbest thing I ever did was to leave the job that took me away from research into that job. Um, I stayed there until a new president came in in 76 and found two things. One, uh, he was very interested in flattening the organization. He was senior vice president and four divisional presidents, and I was that one, and then the president. And he was zigging and I was zagging. So fortunately, he gave me lots of opportunity, lots of time to find myself a new job, which I did. I went down to uh, North Carolina State. Uh, but, but it was an exciting time. I mean, the, there were all kinds of interesting research that was getting done there. Like I mentioned, the realistic job concept. The research on biodata was the, uh, was the non parial absolutely magnificent stuff. And you're talking about developing keys based upon 10,000 respondents and with cross-validation with cross samples of 5,000. Uh, the, the, the instruments given is, is given to hundreds of thousands of people each year. Uh, what was the significance to the statement, get out of your own industry to understand the one you were in? Oh, uh, the turnover rate of life insurance salespersons, the salesmen at that time, almost 90%. Uh, was, was pretty high. And every marketing manager kept saying, you've got to improve selection, you've got to improve selection. 
And I began to say, you know, I wonder if, given the way the job is built, it's possible to do that. So I got the conference board, I think you know what the conference board is, uh, to do a study of sales turnover in other industries and to find out what, what characteristics of the job were associated with, with, with turnover. And when we got all done with that, you can show me that. Sales direct to the public as opposed to a company, a store, or business. A very short training period before you have to start performing. Low starting pay. The early imposition of a performance standard in order to keep your job. And commission compensation. I've just described the life insurance agent's job. And those are the things that in all other kinds of sales jobs were associated with high turnover. Uh, you can imagine the feeling of delight when I talked to the actuaries about this uh, because they didn't want to change the compensation system. They didn't want to change anything. And, and a lot of the marketing managers said, well, we came up this way. Why the heck should we change the system? And so I said, well, you know, it's an interesting, interesting thought. You might think about it sometime. <laughs> yeah, I did use it to get more leverage on better training, a longer training period. But I kept, I, I kept telling them, I said, just look inside your own company at your group sales people. They have, they're selling to businesses. They have a rather extended one to two year period of training and understudy. They have a good starting pay. They don't have an early imposition of a production standard. And they get a salary with a bonus as opposed to a strictly commission. It didn't I didn't didn't really accomplish much with that argument. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good argument. Uh, one other interesting thing I found out back then was that it's sometimes if you're in a business which has a fair number of myths, that's M Y T H S. You better distrust your SMEs when you're doing a job analysis. Example, in early 70s, I guess it was, Bob Knuckles, our consumer researcher, and I kind of got concerned with the fact that every salesman was told when you're trying to make a closing sale on a life insurance from the husband, make sure the wife is not there because she'll kill the sales. She'll say, honey, I don't need it. I, don't, I can take care of myself. Don't worry about it. Or, you know, we can't afford it. And Bob and I thought that was pretty funny because even back then, a number of women control the purse strings in the family. It's not like today when they almost all of them do it, but that's... <laughs> uh, and so Bob developed a very simple little questionnaire to determine who the family financial officer was. Uh, who would know how much is in the checking account? Uh, who would know what's in the savings account? And these, who, who pays the bills, et cetera, et cetera. About six items. And the, on the basis of the responses to that, we were able to determine who was the family financial officer. The husband, the wife, or was it shared? And then we did some consumer studies in which we went out and found people who had recently had an interview, a sales interview, and we got them to answer those questions. And then we found out whether or not at the last interview there was a sale or there wasn't. Interesting enough, we found that in about 75% or more, the woman was the same financial officer or it was shared. When the wife was not there and she was the officer or it was shared, the probability of a sale was very low. If she was there, the probability of a sale was very high. Now the interesting thing is I went out to these general agents and managers meetings, which are almost in every city, and I would give a lecture on that. And when I got all done, I suddenly said, oh, stupid. Next time I went out, I first, before I started, I said, I want to give you a little quiz. I gave them the little questionnaire. And then I said, okay, how many of you are the family financial officer? And almost every hand went up. 
these guys were on commission. And so it's not surprising that they were the family, the family financial officer. And then I said, keep that in mind as you listen to what I'm going to tell you. And I told him, and guess what? After that, the employee was enthusiastic, and a number of managers would come up and say, you've got to come over to the agency. I want you to tell the agents about this. So sometimes there are myths in the industry, and if you rely on your experts, they will not, they are not lying to you. They just are missing for them. Yes. What are you doing now? Did you, you left in 1977, uh, Limrev, to go to North Carolina State uh, mm -hmm. University, and for the first uh, entry in the Side Living Series, History Series last year, I actually interviewed uh, David P. Campbell, who made the opposite switch. He was an academic, and he switched to a practitioner. Um, what led you uh, to head to North Carolina State uh, University, and how did you find the transition from a practitioner to an academic? Well, the answer to the first is very easy. They had a very attractive job there as department head, and I thought it would be, and, and I liked the faculty when I went there for the interview, and so that was good. The transition was a shock. Uh, my travel budget as an individual at Limbra was bigger than the travel budget I had for 26 faculty. The other part of the shock was they took me and they said, Here's your office, there's your desk, there's your filing cabinet, there's the phone, please don't make any long distance calls. <laughs> and if there's anything else you need, get it yourself. <laughs> that sounds like, sounds realistic. <laughs> but I didn't know that when I went to the university. I thought I might have some, oh, I also didn't have, uh, I didn't have free life insurance, I didn't have free health insurance. All those things I already had, had no. So it was a bit of a shock, but, uh, and I was stupid enough not to ask some of my academic colleagues what it would be like before I went there. But it, it all came out. It all worked really well. What were some of the roles you served while you were at North Carolina State, and did you have a favorite one of these roles? Um, department head and mentoring graduate students would be my favorites. Uh, I like teaching, but, but not as much as I like working one-on-one -on -one with the graduate students. Uh, I was also an interim dean while we were looking for another dean. And uh, we, we selected another IO psychologist, Joan Michael. I don't know, know if you know Joan or not. Uh, I was also uh, I <laughs> on selection committees for deans of other colleges. but. Uh, and she said it was exciting, and I, I, I had a whole bunch of really fine graduate students, and I'm sure many of you have had the same experience. Uh, Mike Campion was one of my students, and on Frank Landy's presidential family tree, I've got one branch, that's Mike. <laughs> uh, obviously, Leslie Joyce, uh, whom, as you know, established the uh, Leslie W. Joyce and Paul W. Thayer graduate fellowship, $10,000 a year to a doctoral student who is interested in a career, an application career rather than academic, and was also interested in either in selection, placement, or in training and development. <clears throat> so thus far, uh, the endowment that she has, has been building has paid out $70,000. and. Uh, and that's in honor of the mentoring relationship that she had. She just insisted that she wanted to do something about that. She is, she, by the way, she can afford it. Uh, she is senior vice president and member of the executive committee of <coughs> Novellus, which is the biggest rolled aluminum producer in the world. And she's way up there and does very well. Could probably buy and sell half a dozen of us. And she's a she's a delight, very bright, very. She is she's a good science practitioner. She does database stuff, and is sharp. And you know all you all know Mike, and you've probably read a lot of his stuff. And I, it's, it's many other really really great graduates, but those are the ones that I think you would know. And that's why I mentioned them. 
How did you work to build public consciousness about biopsychology while you were at North Carolina State? Oh, yeah. um, when you are in North Carolina and you're talking about a psychology program, everybody thinks about Chapel Hill. Now we're only about 20 miles apart. <laughs> and I thought we had a pretty damn good department, and I thought, you know, people ought to be, know more about it. I also wanted people to know more about the fact that, that, that there are other kinds of psychology besides clinical. And so I got a number of my colleagues in the department to agree to begin giving lectures about their specialty in the high schools in about a seven county area. Uh, my lecture was was simple. It was, I made up a counterintuitive true-false quiz, gave it to them, they filled it out, and my lecture was the answers to the questions. Counterintuitive, like saying, the best selection device is a personality test. Right, Paul? <laughs> and uh, they're always very surprised by that, saying, it, 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 it's, it was a good way to do it. And as a matter of fact, we began to get more and more people who were interested in the psychology program at NC State. We had the, the biological psychologists, the learning psychologists, the cognitive psychologists, uh, school psychologists, all going out into these, into these high school classes and giving lectures. And it was a good way to, and it, by the way, that's kind of what, if you remember what Tammy was talking about uh, on, on Thursday. Think about treading the word that way. It's a it's it's a good way to get get them while they're young, get them while they're in high school. From 1976 to 1977, you were Division 14, now SIA president. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your presidential address? Uh, you want that now? Yeah. Well, the presidential address was primarily focused in on. The, the stuff that we were doing at Limer, it was called Something's Old, Something's New. And I talked about, about the bio data experience and uh, about, the, about the get outside your industry and take a look at other things. And the basic point that I was trying to make was that, that if you're gonna be, by the way, we were industrial psychologists. We had just only recently become industrial organizational psychologists. Uh, at the point that, basic point when I got all done is that you can't be an industrial psychologist or an organizational psychologist. You've got to be both. You're not going to be able to do good research or do good practice. It's important that you have that broad view. And I get that line, get that line got a little applause. <laughs> Explain what the, the president of SIOP did nearly 40 years ago. Well, uh, one of the things I did was fire the tip editor. Uh, tip was tip was an occasional newsletter, and it was too occasional. As a matter of fact, uh, months and months and months would go by with, with no no tip, and it was really getting pretty sad. And so, after several strong requests, strong requests, strong requests, I finally said, "I'm appointing a new editor." And we got to be more and more. And now, of course, TIP is the model newsletter. Uh, I don't know of a single division of APA that has a newsletter that is as good and as informative as TIP. It's a marvelous thing. It's also kind of interesting. <clears throat> some interesting contrast in the way the, we used to have, when we were division 14, and we're meeting with APA, we used to have business meetings where members would actually vote. And it was very interesting to see, to walk in there. And I was, in, I was especially impressed with the fact that when I first went to a Division 14 meeting, and I would see, look in the, at the business meeting, there would be three, four, five, maybe a dozen women in the audience, most of whom were spouses. Uh, when I became president, I was delighted to look out of the audience and see quite a few males 
and many of those were spouses. Uh, today, if you will look around us as you walk through this place, we're outnumbered. <laughs> the women are taking over, and I think it's, I have always been really angry with how we have wasted half of our human resources for hundreds of years, and I'm glad that is changing. I think it's a great thing that it's changing. And if I hadn't said that, my wife would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe it. You think of uh, other ways uh, to, to compare and contrast SIAP in um, 2014 and when you were president? Well, we used to have, we, we, we met, the, the executive committee would meet uh, at the APA meeting, but we would also have a mid-year meeting, usually in D.C. And we would all fly in and meet Friday afternoon, Friday evening after dinner, drink some dinner, and then Saturday morning and then fly home. That was a very bad model because some of the, when contentious issues came up after dinner, after drinks and dinner, sometimes the discussion got very animated, shall we say. Uh, we finally changed that. Uh, nowadays, the executive committee meets, they will meet tomorrow, all day, and uh, they won't have any drinks until the whole meeting is over. <laughs> but it was, it was a smaller group. Uh, it was uh, much more in informal. Uh, the, the work that, that Kirk Traeger did several years ago in reorg re reorganizing the structure is marvelous. When I came back to the executive committee uh, four years ago, I was just so impressed. I mean, things are organized. Committee chairs have goals. Area reps, the whatever you call those, the ones who supervise all the committees, they have strict programs laid out. They have a reporting system that comes back to the president and the executive board. Uh, it's really a well-run organization that knows what it's doing, rather than the kind of casual organization we were before. Uh, you have every right to be proud of this organization. It's really something. In addition to SIOP, you would uh, served as a, a steward of many important national uh, psychology committees and organizations. Why? What, what led you to these three roles? Uh, Range Wallace and Bill McGee, he both said, we want you to get active in Division 14. If you're going to have a career in this area, you're going to get more support there than you get any other way. <clears throat> it's, you'll make connections, you'll, have, you'll get experiences, you'll get knowledge. It'll be a marvelous thing. In addition to that, you're going to have many opportunities to serve. And uh, I found out that it was fun serving. It's, it's really great to, to work with some of the people who are here in this room and learn what they knew and find out that, boy, are they really good in the areas that they're in. Um, I've got about, I have over 105 years of service for APA, SIOP, APS, and uh, enjoyed every single one of them. And by the way, I'm not 105. <laughs> <laughs> Close, but not 105. <laughs> so if, if I would urge you, those of you who are young, <coughs> get involved, volunteer. It'll be good for you. Uh, some, some general questions. What do you think are the challenges facing Iowa psychology and Iowa psychology professionals today? Pretty much the same ones that we have for years. We still have the, <clears throat> the, the, the things that Tam, Tam was concentrating, excuse me, Tam Tasky was concentrating on on, on Thursday. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I don't know why this. We still have this troublesome split between science and practice, which didn't exist. Um, and 
And I certainly don't want to have it become so serious that you'll get the kind of system that eventually resulted in the creation of APS out of APA. Uh, APS is now a professional organization, and APS is very much a scientific organization. There's still a lot of science in APA, uh, but uh, I was there when that split occurred. As a matter of fact, I was one of the rebels who were leading the battle uh, when we suddenly decided to split off and become the Association for Scientific and Applied Psychology, ASAP, and then later on APS. Uh, I think I think that we. I think we've got to make sure that, we, that something like that doesn't happen. I think we've got to make sure that we continue to recognize the fact that if you're going to be a good practitioner, you damn well better know your science and vice versa. Uh, that's one of the major things. Uh, that, 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 that. Another is, and we've made good strides starting on this already, and that is making sure that we are prepared for this fact that the world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and we are being involved in many more international kinds of activities. Uh, the creation of the consortium, I think, is going to help us in that. And I give uh, Gary Latham and Hoppo a lot of credit for that. And I hope I haven't offended anybody that I might have left out in that, but I think those two are the drivers. Um, I, I think I would agree with Tammy that we've got to figure out how to do a better job of keeping I.O. in psychology departments. Uh, I think to, to see, see my alma mater, Ohio State, lose this program, uh, we've, got to, we've got to get better relations with the basic sciences in psychology so that they will be more receptive to us in traditional departments. And I still, I still am just awed by the fact that Minnesota, Michigan, Michigan State, so for Michigan State especially, not just Michigan, but Minnesota, Michigan State, and so forth, and other leading places, Maryland, have done such an excellent job of continuing to maintain the relationship within both the scientific, pure, you know, the lab science and the, and the applied sciences. And we got to figure out a way to get back into that in all of the leading universities. I think that's enough. Yeah. All right. Does uh, anyone have any questions for Dr. Thayer? Yes. I want you to uh, write your own epithet. What do you, What do you What would you like to be known for when it's all said and done? I don't know. <laughs> What are you um, most proud of? Her and my kids. I mean, aside from <laughs> obvious. <clears throat> um, I'm very proud of them. I'm very proud of the of the associations I've made. I'm, I'm proud of I'm proud of the book. Uh, I'm proud of some of the things I was able to accomplish <clears throat> as an officer of SIOP and of APS and of the medic of APA too. Um, I was a founding member of the APA Insurance Trust. And after the first two years of experience with their income protection plan, I informed the actuaries that the rates were too high. And they lowered them. Because uh, I had done an analysis of the claims and the premiums and so forth. Uh, when, you, when you're able to accomplish some things like that, in APS, I was, I helped the board figure out how to choose publishers. I helped stabilize the finances as treasurer, uh, following in the heels of Bill Hoppel. I think, I think those kinds of things are things that really are important to me. If I, if I could add to that, I would say this is an exemplar person in, in terms of a scientist, in psychology, applying the knowledge to organizations and making a difference. Thank you. Anyone else?
Thank you, Dr. Thayer.